Well, good morning, everyone. For those who are just uh, joining us this morning, we are having folks guess what is in each picture. Um, and so in the chat, you can put one, number one, your guess, number two, your guess, and number three, your guess. And we'll get started in just a couple minutes. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for Coffee with the Casco Baykeeper. It's the third one that we have done since February. And for those who are new here, we are friends of Casco Bay, and our mission is to improve and protect the environmental health of Casco Bay. And we do that through science. We have a 32 year data set of water quality data from Casco Bay. And we also use advocacy. So we take that data, those facts, and we use those to advocate at the municipal, the state, and the federal levels. And we also do community engagement, example A, where we really bring in the community and listen to the community who are the experts in their own backyard in Casco Bay. We really could not do this work without you all. And my name is Sarah Freshly. I am Friends of Casco Bay's community organizer and volunteer coordinator. And this morning I am joined by our Casco Bay keeper, Ivy Frignoka. Morning, Ivy. Good morning, Sarah. I also wanna take a moment to um, welcome you all and thank everyone who uh, has attended one or more of this series. This was um, an idea that Sarah and I came up with where we wanted to share with you some work that we're doing in the moment, um, some sort of you know current research and a current issue that we're working on and really have a conversation with you and answer your questions. And honestly, the kind of questions that you ask help us as we continue to evolve our work. So. Thank you so much for caring and joining us for this series. Yeah, thank you so much. And if you want to be involved in our work, you can head over to our website. Uh, my tech assistant, Sarah, will drop a link in the chat and you can, you can join our work and join our community there. All right, so this morning we are talking about eelgrass. So Ivy, what is eelgrass? Is it in one of these pictures? Well, yes, as as, uh, as everyone correctly identified in, in chat, um, photo number three depicts eelgrass. So photo one is a salt marsh meadow. Um, photo number two is a nuisance um, algal bloom, which relates back to our first program, the, the stormwater talk, because an, um, stormwater delivers <coughs> excess loads of nitrogen, which fertilize these blooms and smother clam flats. And then photo three is depicts eelgrass exposed at a very low tide. And do you want me to say what it is? Yeah, please. You can continue. <laughs> okay. It's a um it's a it's a flowering marine plant that really grows in the shallow subtidal zone. So really it's not often exposed uh like you know, you're more likely to see the salt marsh grasses um, or the nuisance algal blooms at low tide, but so, uh, the eelgrass is really kind of underwater and it's in those shallow subtidal areas. And to me, it kind of like waves around. I used to dance and so it reminds me of like the dance of the sugar plum berries and the nutcracker because they all move together. Um, but to a lot of people, they look like eels, and that's why it's called eelgrass. And why is eelgrass so important to the health of Casco Bay? Well, it is in that shallow subtidal zone, and you can see how its um, roots kind of hold the sediment in place. So it's a it's a food source for um, wildlife. It um, is an essential fish habitat. It's been designated that under federal law. It's a nursery grounds for both uh, invertebrates and, and vertebrates. Um, so some important fish or snail species. Um, and it absorbs um, nitrogen. Um, it is a carbon sink. We're just beginning to sort of, we, the collective scientific community is studying it more and more as a source of um, blue carbon. And because it is rooted into the substrate, it holds the sediment in 
place so that during storms, it helps protect against um, erosion and loss of the sediment. And I think one other thing I would say about it is that it really requires clean, clear water to grow. So it's a real indicator of the health of a particular area. So it's even used um, in setting limits and Clean Water Act permits. That, um, because if it's clear, clean and healthy, then you know that there's not too much nitrogen being discharged. And if it's, if it's not, then um, it could be that there needs to be a reduction in the load of nitrogen being discharged in an area. Is eelgrass under threat? Yes. Can we go on to the next slide, please? And I promise you all, we're not going to do a whole bunch of slides. We just wanted to uh, show, show some things. So this audience probably could go through and talk about what all of these mean. But um, so I just left off my last answer by talking about what eelgrass needs to be healthy. And if you look at the first photo in this series, that's a reasonably healthy eelgrass bed. So the water around it is more clear. Um, it's of, I'd say, sort of moderate density. There isn't a lot of growth um, on the blades. Um, so it's that or even more thickly, um, you know, thickly populated bed that we would be looking for in terms of health, healthy eelgrass. So the threats to it, um, in the second photo, what you see is an eelgrass that has been ripped out by its root so that you see that shredding there. And that's been caused by uh, green crabs going through the eelgrass and ripping out the blades as they're foraging for food. And then the third photo hones in on a number of possible causes that threaten eelgrass. You can see how thin the um, eelgrass is. It's just very spotty as opposed to a nice, you know, sort of thick lawn of eelgrass, if you will. And you can see that the water is more cloudy. We don't know if that's from um, too much nitrogen being discharged in the water and causing a phytoplankton bloom, or um, which is what this appears like. Um, but also storm water, like for anyone who's been at around East End after a major rainstorm in the Prescott River delivers all the sediment down in, you see all the brown cloudiness that could have an impact on it. Um, you can see that there's a lot of growth on these eelgrass blades and that sort of filamentous algae that's hanging off or epiphytes. Other, these are like other um, plants that grow on eelgrass blades and live there. And then of course, decrease the light to the eelgrass itself and uh, impact its health. That's what's going on. And then we also don't know just from that photo if um, if the temperatures of the water have gotten so warm that it's not good for eelgrass health. So that's some of the many things that could be impacting the health of the eelgrass in that third photo. And folks, just so you know, we are going to answer questions at the end of this session. So as we're going along, feel free to put any questions you have in the chat. So Ivy, have these threats that you just talked about impacted eelgrass beds here in Casco Bay? Yes, um, in, a, in an upsetting way. Uh, so may we have the next slide, please? We're almost done with slides, so sorry. <laughs> sorry. Well, um, so we there there isn't a ton of uh, really great historic data on eelgrass beds in Casco Bay, but we do have data going back to 1993, 1994. That is very solid scientifically. Um, and what you see here is a difference between eelgrass mapping in 2018 and eelgrass mapping in 2022 in Casco Bay. Um, what this shows is that um, a, a slightly over 54% loss of eelgrass coverage in just four years. And where it primarily is occurring is if you look from South Freeport on up through Eastern Casco Bay, we have had almost a complete 
loss of eelgrass, which is really upsetting and concerning because that's we have critical um, fish habitats there, and there's a lot of you know there's still commercial fishing and shell fishing that occurs in those areas. And Ivy, can you tell us about what work Friends of Casco Bay is doing to protect eelgrass from all this loss? Yes. Um, do you want to go to the DEX map? Okay. So I should have mentioned, I just saw that um, Sarah added in chat that you can see the full maps. For those of you who really know that Casco Bay extends from Cape Elizabeth to Phippsburg, when you when we go into um, ArcGIS and capture images, it's hard to get the entire um, Casco Bay onto our images, and we we're trying to abstract something that you could actually see in a in a PowerPoint slide, and that would depict the significant loss of eelgrass. So that's why the images were as they are. It's not because we were looking at at the full bed. And I did see someone mention that there's a pretty good bed of eelgrass off of Willard Beach. And that is correct. That That's still a pretty healthy bed of eelgrass. So now you asked what, um, what uh, we are doing about eelgrass. And when that report came out, um, the, the eelgrass survey that was done in 2022 was the first done under a bill that um, we help pass in the legislature that requires the state of Maine to map eelgrass and salt marsh along the entire Maine coast in five year cycles. So they broke the coast down into five regions and every five years a different region gets mapped. In 2018, Casco Bay got mapped because the Casco Bay Estuary Partnership and other um, partners uh, contributed money that allowed the Department of Environmental Protection to map um, Casco Bay. So 2022 is the first funded by by this the state. Um, so with this monitoring and then with this report that was issued based on those findings, the report, uh, although the divers went out and sort of ground truthed um, all the findings, because um, a lot of the mapping is done by aerial flights and then scientists go out in the field and they dive and they set up transects to to really study what's going on with that survey they knew that over 54 percent of all eelgrass beds had disappeared but not really why specific beds were feeling failing right we know these like sort of general causes but not the specificity and so what friends of casco bay is doing is uh we went back to the estuary partnership and to colleagues at epa and and uh, the Department of Environmental Protection here in Maine, uh, Manomet, which studies green crabs, and then Team Zostra, which is a team of volunteer divers um, from the Cobalt. And we um, asked if we could do a collaborative study to try to understand why eelgrass beds are failing. So we set up a pilot, um, because this is like sort of the first really comprehensive project of this type. And so we wanted to set up a pilot. And we chose the bed off Mackworth Island and a bed in Broad Cove off Broad Cove Reserve for this pilot. Ideally, we would have chosen a bed in Eastern Casco Bay as our second site, but there's no eelgrass left to study. So we need to start somewhere else, better understand what's going on, and then see if in the future we can apply lessons learned to um, Eastern Casco Bay. So at these two sites, that team that I identified under the coordination of the estuary um, partnership um, will be, everyone will be in their wheelhouse of expertise. So Manomet will be deploying green crab traps and 24 hour cycles three to five times. Those will have GoPro cameras on. So we'll get some idea of what's going on underwater and the, um, quantity of green crabs, males, females, size, that sort of thing. Uh, we'll stick in our wheelhouse and do water quality monitoring. Um, we're going to add, uh, we have special equipment that we uh, 
we're able to get this year through a grant um, to monitor the light penetration. We'll look at nitrogen samplings. Uh, Mike will be using a SON to record water quality data. The Department of Environmental Protection will also be doing water quality monitoring, and they'll be deploying sensors to track temperature in 15 minute increments. And then the dive team from Team Zostra will be um, diving to see when the, these two eelgrass beds go to seed because you need you often collect seed and then use that for restoration efforts. So that's year one of this of this two year study. What do you hope to learn from all of the scientific work that is is happening in Broad Cove and Mackworth Island? Yes, we hope to learn the specific reasons why these beds are losing coverage, right? So there's that laundry list, but that's just, we haven't applied it specifically to these sites. And we feel like we need to understand why something is failing before we can try to restore it. Um, so like for example, if, the research and this team of experts all together determines that the temperature range in this in these near shore areas is now too warm for the type of eelgrass we have growing here then we need to ask ourselves questions like can we help is it appropriate to kind of look at forced migration techniques where you take seeds from healthy eelgrass beds that are more heat tolerant sterilize those seeds so you don't bring in disease or invasive species from other areas and experiment with restoration there. So we hope to get some answers so that we can ask ourselves those questions and then experiment with restoration next year. Are there any laws or regulations in place that protect eelgrass beds? Well, it's designated as um, essential fish habitat under federal law. And um, in Maine, just as a general overview to not get too wonky into the law, um, in eelgrass, uh, in aquaculture leasing, the applicants are required to map the flora and fauna in the area. So the flora would include the eelgrass. It doesn't specifically say eelgrass, but um, the Department of Marine Resources considers that and dives on sites and um, sites aquaculture so that it doesn't shade out areas. The goal is it sites aquaculture so it doesn't shade out areas where eelgrass grows or historically grows. Um, in the Department of Environmental Protection, the Natural Resources Protection Act um, also, it protects all coastal um, wetlands, which includes eelgrass beds. And the two primary ways that I know that that affects Casco Bay is that that would cover dredging projects um, to protect eelgrass beds and also putting um, up docks and piers. Uh, they also need to go under, let's call it NERPA um, review, and that protects it. And then um, the last area is um, under the Clean Water Act, the permits that regulate discharges from uh, things like sewage treatment plants, if there if there's too much nitrogen in a particular area, the, those permits can also set limits to reduce the nitrogen load and help restore the health of eelgrass beds. So that's some of the sort of key legal ways that eelgrass is protected. What can community members do to help eelgrass? Well, um, we are looking for volunteers for this summer. Um, what we're hoping is that at both Broad Cove and Mackworth, we could get uh, one or more volunteers to go there weekly and document what they see about eelgrass. Like, are you finding shoots washing up on the shore that look like it's been shredded by green crab? Are you finding a lot of eelgrass washing up? Um, what are you seeing on the eelgrass blades? And we would provide training and go out in the field with you at first, but that data 
would really help inform what we do in year two for restoration. So we're looking for volunteers at those two beds. And then if a lot of people are interested, we would love to have volunteers all around Casco Bay tracking eelgrass this summer through your water reporter program that you coordinate, Sarah, so that we can also compare the data, see what we're seeing at these two sites versus others. And beyond that, um, all, all the things that many of you do as good um, stewards of Casco Bay, you know, being conscientious about, do I need to apply lawn fertilizers? Um, if, if, you know, if, if not, please don't. Um, and then if you do like, having a, a setback, a buffer zone, keeping your lawn higher so there's less runoff, that that sort of thing. Um, if you need to rebuild a, a dock or a pier because of the storm, try to make it as high as possible and as narrow as possible so there's light underneath. Uh, boat moorings, um, traditional moorings, farm meal grass. Um, there are conservation moorings that maybe cost a little more, but don't don't harm eelgrass beds. Be conscientious when boating. Uh, towns often mark channels through eelgrass beds or when walking um, you know, in the water along beach areas. I know there's eelgrass beds at East End Beach, along Broad Cove, um, Willard Beach. So those are some of the things people could do, but we really hope you help us with the research this summer. Before we go to questions from our community, Ivy, is there anything else that you wanna mention? Yeah, I just want to thank you all for um, for joining us for this series, and um, we really do love your feedback and take it into account while we're doing our work. So let's go to their questions. I'm really eager to hear people's questions. Yeah, sounds um, great. Are you going to invite our yeah. buddy? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we have a special guest. Uh, but first, I do want to say that when we um, send our follow up email about this, we will be sending a survey um, that we ask for your feedback on our whole copy with the Casco Baykeeper series. We have done three. And so take a look for that survey and we would really appreciate your feedback. It's gonna be short, I promise. So for questions, we do have a special cameo appearance by our staff scientist, Mike Doan. Uh, so he is just here to, to help Ivy answer questions and um, is available for questions as well. All righty. <laughs> Hi, Mike. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so Ivy, you were mentioning certain years when talking about the historical maps. We had 2018 and 2022. So has mapping been inconsistent? Yes, um, I'm really glad this question was asked. Um, so historically, the Department of Marine Resources did the mapping. When funding ended for that, mapping didn't occur. So the years that we have data for mapping are 1993-94, I'm looking down so I can read these dates, um, 2001 and 2, 2013, 2018, and 2022. Those are the years we have data for Casco Bay. That is um, the kind of high quality, reliable data upon which we would you know, make decisions or regulators would make decisions. So it was spotty. It will not be going forward because now this is a it's a law that requires it, and that law um, mandated funding for this purpose. So that was a major um, in fact. We gave a Casco Bay Award to the legislator who, <laughs> who really lobbied for and champions that bill last year because it's going to make such a big difference. So yes, and I have that data in front of me if anybody is uh, interested in a little overview of some of the just a big takeaway from that. <clears throat> Do you want me to, I guess I can just share that. Um, I would say in the early years, like in the 93, 94, 2001, 2002, the total acreage of eelgrass in, the, uh, in 93, 94 was over 7,000 acres. And in 2001, 2002 was over 8,000 acres. And the vast majority of those acres had moderate to thick coverage, which means percent coverage of say um, 40 to 100%. And by 2022, we have 
2,286 acres of coverage, and the majority of that um, has only 10 to 40 percent of coverage. So not only have we lost a lot of eelgrass, what is remaining is not that healthy. And I know I, I saw Paul mention the healthy eelgrass up behind Fort Gorgeous. There's a bed off of Jewel Island that I'm in love with. You know, there are places where there are still healthy eelgrass beds, but overall, that the 70 to 100 percent coverage of eelgrass beds in Casco Bay now is only 211 acres. That's really a small amount. A related question is um, one person asked or pointed out that the current protections for eelgrass that you mentioned seem to rely on mapping that was done after a lot of eelgrass beds were already depleted. So is there a way for public policy, for advocacy to try to address that gap? Yes. So um, first off, the the way that the Department of Environmental Protection looks at the laws, and I, I think this is true in aquaculture as well, it's also where historically there was eelgrass. Because um, it, Eelgrass, as a you know, as flowering seed plant, it it comes and goes anyway. Like what we're trying to tease out is there are other factors that um, are leading to the demise of eelgrass. So they are not just looking at where eelgrass currently exists because that would not help, but also where it historically is known to to have existed, and that that is a big factor in permit review. This person asked, where are some of the best places to find Zostra? And for those of you who don't know, the scientific name for the species of eelgrass that we're talking about is Zostra marina. So that's why sometimes you refer, we, we hear it referred to as Zostra. So where are the, some of the best places to find it? Was this just in general or what that you can get to without going out to one of the islands? I believe in general or both? Um, well, I think the, the map that we showed from 2022 has um, some, you know, some of those areas. I would say to easily get to, um, Willard Beach is, uh, has a really nice bed that is actually visible at the lowest of low tides. Um, so that would be a good place to acquaint yourself with a good healthy eelgrass bed. Um, Broad Cove, um, Mackworth Island, which is why we chose it. Although I don't know, uh, I don't know how easy that bed is to see. I mean, that's that's the thing with these, right? They're subtitle, so it's not like the rock reed that we see at low tide, all, um, growing along our our rocky coast or on the salt marsh that's just more visible all the time. But Willard is certainly a, an easy place to see it. Mike, do you have any other? Um, no, that's the one I was thinking of. At, at a good low, low tide, Willard is pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah, and given that eelgrass is under threat, if people do want to see the eelgrass beds, they are really beautiful. What are some best practices to, to keep it safe as you're viewing it? I'd say maybe don't walk through it. Um, if you're a snorkeler, um, carefully snorkeling over it, and you don't want to, like, disturb the water a lot. Um, waiting for the extreme low tide, um, you could carefully um, kayak over it. I know we're uh, one of the things Mike is um, trying to figure out this summer is how we're going to carefully boat over it so we can do our water quality monitoring without disturbing the eelgrass. We sure as heck aren't going to be anchoring in there. So, um, so those are those are some of the ways that you could do it. And we're also hoping that we can get some footage with the GoPro mm -hmm. camera um, in the studies this summer and share that all with you by the fall. If eelgrass is temperature dependent, earlier you were talking about how warming waters may may impact it. Is it found in southern U.S. waters or is it a northern plant? Yes, it is found in southern waters. That that's part of why we were saying like there's different 
strains and um, some of our colleagues, when we saw this like really disappointing loss of eelgrass, like something that just stunned us and saddened us, we reached out to colleagues that we know through the Environmental Protection Agency and then also other water keepers um, who are working further south. And we learned about this program called Common Gardens where people are beginning to experiment with um, trying to see if they can take seeds from areas that are growing healthy eelgrass and are more heat tolerant. Whether or not we can do that in Maine, we don't know yet. Mike, anything to add there? No, that's it. It was good. Okay. Based on the data that, that we have collected on water quality and temperature, um, is could that explain the differences in water quality or temperature in eastern Casco Bay versus western Casco Bay that would explain the the decline of eelgrass beds more heavily in eastern Casco Bay? That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I think if yeah, right, I think if I understand it, um, to me the the areas in eastern Casco Bay where the eelgrass grass beds are growing first, I have been told by. A number of clamors, one of whom just emailed me yesterday that there are a ton of green crabs in those areas. So um, that could be a particular factor there. Then these are also really shallow um, embayments for long distances. And we know from some um, sensors that the town of Brunswick deployed that the water temperatures in this area are very, very high that could be a factor. And then these are areas where we often see the water is really, they, there will be this, there will be um, prolonged phytoplankton blooms that make the water cloudy and storm water loads that make the water cloudy. So there could be a lot of factors why eelgrass isn't there, but we don't have enough eelgrass there to, to study it right now. Mike, is there, yep. yes, it's a good question. I'm surmising, is there anything you would add to that? Or oh, we, uh... Temperatures in Casco Bay tend to be pretty consistent across the bay, maybe a bit colder um, to the west around South Portland, Portland, but uh, probably not enough to make a difference in the eelgrass uh, that we're seeing. But we'll keep looking. One person asks, is it possible that the population of eelgrass waxes and wanes on its own and that it will actually be more abundant five years from now? Eelgrass does wax and wane yeah. on its own. And what we're, and, and um, can you ask us that question again in the fall? Um, like what we're <laughs> trying to tease out is what's going on. And, and let me give you an example. Um, I, this is an example I've talked about before. The East End Wastewater Treatment Facility did a phenomenal job reducing their um, nitrogen load that they were discharging into the bay. And I say their nitrogen load, the load from all the people that <laughs> send their waste to the plant and that they process. And um, they, with that significant reduction in load, we saw a significant decrease in the amount of total nitrogen um, in the water because we collect water samples off of there. And there were signs that the eelgrass in that area was um, recovering health. There was less um, of that filamentous algae or epiphytic growth on the eelgrass beds. So uh, there are human caused reasons why eelgrass is decreasing on top of the natural cycle. And that I think is what we're trying to tease out. Mike? And of course, the green crabs as well. Yes, definitely. So um, it, having that 54% that drop in, in such a short period of time, there has to be more than just natural patterns in, in this case. Yeah. Ivy, I know you mentioned this a little bit, um, but can you talk more about whether there is a known way of reseeding eelgrass? There are known ways of reseeding eelgrass. I know um, I am definitely want Mike to chime in on this one because he was involved. Um, Mike is not only our amazing staff scientist, but he's our resident historian because he's <laughs> been with the organizations <laughs> since he was an intern. Oh, it's um, okay. <laughs> and, um, so he was involved in early experiments with um, trying to 
to replant uh, eelgrass in Casco Bay. So, Mike, I'm going to turn this over to you, and then I'll add to it from what I've learned from the other water keepers. Sure, I'll I'll keep it brief. But there are different ways to to transplant, I guess, eelgrass that have been effective. Um, I know Hillary Nichols is on this call, and, and she would certainly be able to answer this better than I, but. It can be done. I think what we're really trying to do now is figure out what the stressors are, why we're losing eelgrass before we get into the, the transplanting or reseeding or whichever direction we go in. But there are, certainly you can you can transplant eelgrass. And then what I would add to that is um, I'm trying to learn from other water keepers who are also working on this issue and are a little further south than us. So for example, um, in talking with the Great Bay uh, keeper, she uh, found that when eelgrass restoration was done in the spring, it failed because the water temperatures were warm, too warm over the summer. And when they tra tried to transplant or seed with eelgrass in the fall, they had higher success rates. So like that's something we might consider the Long Island Soundkeeper is being even more creative. He's putting seeds on clam shells and the trident plant deploy those these shells. So there are lots of things to look at. And that's why we're very um grateful in this project that we have, you know, a team of experts who's going to be looking at this. And Hillary, we would love to get your input too. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, we have People, you know, experts from DEP, EPA, and then the leadership of the Casca Bay Estuary Project on this. Yeah. So speaking of those partnerships, is it is it typical to do collaborative research like this? It is for us. Yep. Um, we we really have an expertise and focus on, and when I say we, I mean Mike, <laughs> really have an expertise and focus on. Um, on the actual water, you know, so assessing water quality, looking for trends and change, um, understanding ocean acidification, that sort of thing. So in a, in a system like this, where we know it's just incredibly important to the health of Casco Bay to see if there's any way to save eelgrass beds, right? And we're an organization founded on hope and positivity. Um, the This collaborative research really allows us to work with a team where everybody's got a different expertise and we can come together, think together, design the best possible pilot and um, and just keep advancing what we know and how, how, how we're trying to find solutions that may work. If folks have detailed information about eelgrass presence or absence due to say, mapping before a flow is built, uh, would it be helpful for them to share that information? Yes. So when a, when a dock or pier is built, that's supposed to be evaluated and eelgrass beds are considered by the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, I also I only know from my own town that um, in, in my town, our Coastal Waters Commission also goes out and does a site visit and um, looks at the particular site. So yes, if, you're, uh, if, if you have um, information that would be relevant, uh, you know, I think that that would be something the Department of Environmental Protection would very much want. So we have time for one more question. And that question is going <laughs> to be, in the time that it takes to study eelgrass, um, is, is the eelgrass that's in danger of going too low to be able to recover? Does that make sense? I, I think so. I think- um, Like, what... is it worth studying? Is it gonna deplete by the time we're done yeah. the, these two year research projects? Yes, so um, this is a very astute question and a great question to end on. So what's happening, not just with eelgrass, but with ocean acidification and other other factors is that these changes are occurring rapidly and they continue to occur. So there is no like static, right? Like we can't just get like a, uh, we, can, we can't wait. This question implies something we firmly agree with. We can't wait to have 15 years of data and that's not even gonna help us with this kind of situation. 
And so that's why we're starting with this pilot project to see if we can hone in, get some understanding, say, what do we need to study better? And then experiment right away with restoration. And then not only just do it here, but we're tied into a network of people up and down the Atlantic coast. Like we go to meetings that cover all the uh, um, research. And then we, like I said, we talk with other water keepers. It's a great part about being um, a water keeper organization. So no, we cannot wait for a long-term data set um, and we will act. And that means we have to be nimble and adaptive. And so we will keep trying things. And, um, you know, there's a business concept about failing forward. And I hate to use the word failing, but it's like you, we can't be afraid to try because if we don't try, then um, then we could end up in a situation where there's no real grass. Still some left. We're still trying. <laughs> Thanks, Ivy. So folks, thank you so much for joining us today. There are links in the chat for you to volunteer, sign up for our emails and join our community. We are a friends organization and we could not do this work without our community. I know that we didn't get to all of the questions. I love how many questions there were, but you can always email us with more questions and we will be sending a follow-up with a recording of this um, webinar and as well as a survey and we would really appreciate if you filled out the survey so we can continue to have more great programs like this bye everyone thank you so much thanks all have a great day